of Wisconsin Madison. Um, uh, Chunyu is a postdoc and um, she will um, talk about her research on investigating special specificity in the uh, interaction between working memory and visual perception. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to this talk. I'll jump right into it. Um, wait. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So in our daily life, what we hold in our working memory constant interacts with our ongoing perception of the environment. And studies have demonstrated that working memory can influence visual processing um, in a bunch of different ways. For example, um, if you hold a cover in your working memory, it can influence your attentional selection in the visual search task. And working memory content can influence perceptual sensitivity for low level visual features such as color and orientation. And in addition, it can even um, influence the conscious access for new incoming information. And so one potential mechanism that accounts for such a rich interaction between memory and perception is that both memory maintenance and visual processing might um, recruit the shared neural substrates in their early visual processing areas. And so one question that remains unclear is how spatially specific this memory perception interaction is. And there are a lot of evidence suggesting that the memory presentation can be um, represented in a global fashion. So if we maintain a blue color, for example, in mind, it will um, activate all the blue selective channels regardless of the spatial location of where the memory representation was first like, presented. And so if that's the case, we will expect the interaction between memory and perception to be more in the global pattern. Um, alternatively, there are also evidence showing that the memory representation can have a degree of spatial, um, spatial sensitivity into it. Um, and if that's the case, then maintaining a blue color will actually influence processing at this specific location to a greater extent and will predict a more spatially specific interaction between memory and perception. So in the current um, study, I want to show you um, a set of foresight physics experiments that looks into the spatial specificity of this interaction and um, trying to come up with an explanation for the observations of both global and spatially specific um, representations here. So in the first experiment, we um, looked at influence of maintaining an orientation um, on a secondary discrimination task. So subjects are first pr um, pr presented with two boards on each side of the screen, together with a central arrow pointing either to the left or right. So subjects memorized the orientation that's pointed by this arrow. And then during the delay period, um, they perform a secondary discrimination task based on the orientation of this new Gabor. So this, um, this new Gabor could appear either on the left or the right side um, and superimposed by some noise patterns. And so the task here is to make a judgment about its orientation, whether clockwise or counterclockwise compared with the vertical direction. Um, and after they make the response, um, the memory call will start, so they are going to press keys to rotate this um, orientation dial to um, match with the memory orientation. So the key manipulation here is the congruency in orientation and location between the memory sample and the discrimination stimuli. So they could internally match in their orientation or location, or they could be different. And so we also manipulated the contrast of this um, discrimination stimulus from ranging from low to high contrast so that we can derive their accuracy in this test as a function um, as the contrast of it and use this to derive their contrast threshold that get, they could reliably detect its orientation. So um, we first, if we first focus on the feature-based facilitation, right? So how does orientation congruency might have effect on the perception of this discrimination stimulus? We predict that um, if the orientation of the two um, are entirely the same, um, the discrimination threshold should be lower than the incongruent condition. This is because the congruency between the two in orientation should facilitate the processing of the discrimination stimulus. And then more, we are um, more interested in is, you know, how does location congruency might have a modulation effect on this effect, right? So if uh, according to the global account, we should see this effect regardless of location congruency, but if it's more spatially specific, then we will see a bigger effect when the location of the two also matched. So now I'm gonna move on to show you the results in this experiment. First, I'm gonna show you when the location of the memory sample and the discrimination stimulus are both matched. Um, and as you can see, um, people's performance were um, more accurate when the orientation of the two were congruent. 
um, compared with the orientation incongruent condition. And the um, derived threshold in the con orientation congruent condition was significantly low, um, lower. So which means that there is indeed this feature-based facilitation between memory and perception at this congruent location. Um, and interestingly, when we turn to the location incongruent condition, we did not find much of a difference between orientation congruent versus incongruent condition. So um, and if we plot the full derived threshold here, right, um, um, full location and um, orientation congruency, we can find, we can see that there is a um, very obvious uh, location modulation effect here. So there is an interaction between the two factors um, and suggesting that there is this degree of spatial specificity in this interaction. And we further analyzed, um, besides from the threshold, we also analyzed the memory precision. So how does perceiving this discrimination stimulus has an impact on the memory representation? And we, um, this time we actually find many facts for both um, location and orientation congruency, but didn't find the interaction. So it could be that when people are shifting their attention away from the memory encoding location and process and additional information, this has a detrimental effect on their memory precision. Um, so overall in this experiment, we find that there is this um, certain degree of spatial specificity in this interaction. And so in experiment two, we carry on um, and had a, made a very small tweak on the paradigm. And the goal here is to see does memory still enhance its perception when the orientation is now task irrelevant in the discrimination task. And the purpose of this task is to uh, make sure that what we are observing in experiment one is driven by stimulus specific interactions between these memory and perception, not, uh, and not by some you know, response mode or the shared task demands. And so the, task, the memory task is exact, exactly the same. What's different is in the discrimination task, so they first see this uh, discrimination Gabor um, followed quickly by a mask. And the task here is to directly report what was the contrast they perceived during the discrimination task. So as to get a direct measurement of what was the perceived contrast in this secondary task. And we predict that if what we observe in experiment one is actually due to a low level feature-based interaction, we should see the same level of facilitation here, even if orientation is now task irrelevant. And that's in fact um, what we observed um, in our results. So I plotted their reported contrast. So the perceived contrast as a function of the presented contrast. Um, and we can see when the location of the two were congruent, um, the, or the congruency between the memory sample and the discrimination stimulus indeed facilitated the perceived contrast um, for, you know, the, for the discrimination stimulus. Um, and this effect was not um, evident when the location was incongruent between the two. And so then what I did was um, simply just average over the reported contrast for all these um, presented contrast levels and um, looked at for uh, the difference for the four conditions here. And we see that location, there is a significant interaction between the two factors. So a big difference when the location was congruent and um, less of a feature-based facilitation when the location was incongruent. And similarly, this time when we um, analyzed memory precision, we find the same um, sp spatial specific effect in the memory precision as well, consistent with the perceived contrast. And so across these two experiments, I demonstrated that um, the interaction between working memory and visual processing can be spatially specific, right? But if we think about the literature, there are also a lot of evidence showing that memory can influence perception in a more global way. And what could that be? So we specifically, um, tested hypothesis in the next two experiments that the context binding demand might influence the spatial specificity of this effect. So in the context when you know, location is more re relevant for the task, people might represent the um, information in a more spatially specific way. And so in the next two experiments, we explicitly manipulated the context binding demand. So in experiment three, we created a task um, that's very similar to experiment one and two, but with um, a low context binding demand. So now the memory sample um, was only presented alone by itself, right? So this is to reduce any competition and binding demand during coding. And then they performed the same orientation judgment task during discrimination. And then during the recall, this recall dial now is presented centrally um, on the screen instead of at the memory encoding location. And so we hypothesized that with this design, it should reduce people's context binding demand and even discourage them to use location information. 
versus in the high contact spanning demand um, um, experiment, we make um, test we make the location of this memory sample actually test relevant here. So they need to hold on to the location of this information as well in order to succeed in this task. So um, what it means is that during the recall, right now the recall dial could appear on the same at the same location as the memory encoding location, or on the opposite side of the screen. And so if if it appear at the same location, subjects just report the exact same orientation that they memorized. Versus when they appear on the opposite side, then they need to re uh, report the orientation that's orthogonal to it, so 90 degree away from it, and requires um, extra mental manipulation, right? And so we hypothesize that when the contact spanning demand um, should be higher here, right? It should be pretty high here because the location is relevant. So in this case, we think that we should see a sp spatial and more specific effect versus in the low contact spanning demand, we should more be more likely to see a global effect. Um, so now I'm gonna show you the results for the low binding demand um, condition here. So in experiment three, and this time we find that for both um, location congruent and incongruent conditions, we see the same exact feature-based facilitation. Um, and it was not modulated, um, the interaction was not significant. And the same pattern was confirmed in the memory precision as well. So um, consistent with each other, showing that when the binding demand is low, people tend to represent this feature in a more global pattern. Um, and in comparison, when the binding demand is high, we again see that um, memory, um, you know, the memory orientation had an impact on perception. And the difference, the feature-based facilitation was obvious, um, was obvious and significant for both congruent and incongruent condition. But more importantly, the magnitude of this enhancement was um, modulated by the location congruency. So the effect was bigger when the location was congruent and um, smaller when the location was incongruent. And when we look at the memory precision, um, when the probe of the, when the memory probe, right, appear at the same location, we see the same spatial based um, modulation, but we didn't see it when the probe was different. Um, so anyway, that's all the results I have for the four experiments. Um, and so to conclude, um, in, the, in all four experiments, we demonstrated that there is this bidirectional interaction between working memory and perception that is stimulus specific. And moreover, um, how spatially specific this interaction is depends on the relevancy of the location. So if they're if, you know, in a context that requires low context binding, um, people tend to represent it in a more global way, but when location is not as relevant, um, then um, there is more of a spatial, um, spatially specific representation. So this, I think this basically highlights the flexibility of memory encoding, right? We are able to optimize the memory presentation depending on the exact text, um, text uh, demand or the context and to optimize our behavior. So I want to thank my lab and um, Thank you all for your attention and thank the organizers of New Match. And I'm now ready to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chun Yu, for the great talk. Um, we have a question in QA. Um, so um, Jason says excellent talk. And um, he asks, do you think that some level of um, some low-level interaction between the working memory is stimulus? and the discrimination stimulus is playing a role as opposed to working memory storage per se. Uh, what if um, subjects uh, had to drop the item? Uh, would the, uh, the effects go away? Um, I think that's a great question. So if I understand it correctly, um, he's asking you know, if this effect that we're seeing here can be accounted for other like factors like perceptual priming or, you know, um, adaptation. So um, I think, um, although my current study didn't really have a condition that um, the mem that the you know memory item is like dropped or like not relevant, but in my previous work, I found that um, if you're holding on to um, like memory maintenance, it had a different long-lasting effect compared with just perceived the information. So um, if the feature is not maintaining working memory, it has a brief effect on um, perception, but this effect goes away with a longer you know, interval. So I think um, maybe 
I, I would say like, you know, perceptual priming and working memory driven effect might have a very similar neural basis, right? But the temporal dynamics of the two processes um, would be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh